I, I, I just would say for the younger uh, Eli's in the audience, stay in touch with your students because um, one of my regrets is I think after I left the Yale China program for about 10 or 15 years, I was out of contact with Yale China. I stayed in touch with some of my students, but then I gradually lost contact with them. So please do stay in touch with your students. I, it's a regret to me that I did not do that. So you know, learn from your elders. And watch out, your <laughs> watch out for your forearm. Watch out for your forearm. This is a high intellectual level of what was going on. <laughs> Marx Brothers in China. <laughs> Bill, you were among the very first to be in China in the 70s and 50s and 60s. We longed to be there. We heard the stories of what had gone on for decades before Yale China left China. You went back. What was it like to be there in those years? 1981, you went, right? <laughs> Now, you're asking a question I didn't prepare to answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Sorry, it's my own Talk among <laughs> yourselves. <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, Drake, of course, is a master of both Cantonese and, and Mandarin, but he hasn't yet spoken the most beautiful dialect of all of China. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet wife uh, wisely disappeared from me as soon as we arrived. <laughs> I, okay. Uh, I don't want to embarrass her by trying to speak more Changsha dialect. Uh, people uh, uh, say, well, so do you learn Chinese from your wife? And she'll say, well, which is a classical expression, you cannot carve rotten wood. <laughs> Uh, I guess, uh, and also I can call Drake in humor. So this is a, a slightly serious thought because the question posed to us was, how has Yale, the Yale China experience changed you? And this doesn't uh, relate directly to the time that I was a Yale China bachelor, 81 to 84 in Changsha. But it was a few years later, and I was flying on a plane uh, back to the states from from China, and. Uh, as more and more Chinese students come to the United States, that you frequently you will see two older Chinese people who appear to be taking the very first airplane ride of their lives, and they're presumably the parents of, of children who are graduate students in China. Um, now, in travels in the countryside, occasionally I would meet local peasants and, and ask them how much schooling they've had, and they would respond, well, they would talk. I have no culture. And so this word culture, one talk, and it seems to me, oh, isn't this a terrible example of how the intellectual elite of China have imposed this elite culture upon ordinary people? That how could a person with this rich peasant culture say, I have no culture? Um, but the word they it, used in Chinese for culture, one is the written word, and then hua is transformed. Well, two of the parents on this particular flight were illiterate. And so here we have a, a, you know, the, the child of illiterate parents pursuing a PhD in astrophysics in the United States. Um, and in order to help his parents on their flight over to the United States, he had prepared pictures. And so if they needed to eat food, there was a picture of the food that they could eat. And to go to the bathroom, a little picture that would represent the bathroom. And so this was the first time that I finally realized the significance of this Chinese word for culture, wanhua, to be transformed by the written word. Um, and so that was just a, was a very moving experience for me. And just realizing that being in Yale, China, as an American to go to China, that I had truly been transformed by that experience, as I think so many of us have. And, and long may that uh, exchange continue. You and many, many others. Carol, I give up on uh, directing Yale China. <laughs> <laughs> Share a thought with us, please. <laughs> um, sure. First of all, I'd just like to say what an honor it is to be on a panel with Drake Pike and Bill Watkins. This morning, I was trying to explain to a friend um, the context of what I was about to do, and I said, it's kind of like being a street musician performing with Lady Gaga and Beyonce. <laughs> Lady Gaga and Beyonce. So, um, I think uh, I'll, I'll try to respond about just when I think of the word relationships and in context of Yale China, I think.
probably everyone who's been on the fellowship um, immediately thinks of students um, and just the amazing relationships you create with your students, um, even beginning with just getting to know their names. And we all know and remember um, them coming up with quite unique names since they get choice and agency in their names, um, like Angel, Vanilla, um, and I had one student who had the infamous name of Nobody. <laughs> So, yeah, so I just want to reflect a little bit on um, how Yale China has transformed me through my students. I have learned so much through my students, and one of the most, I think, humbling moments was um, a time when I was able to go on a community service trip with my students to um, teach at a migrant worker's school, migrant workers' children's school in the outskirts of Beijing. Um, and it was amazing seeing my students teach. And one of the things that I remember um, that actually led me to teaching now is when we were able to go visit one of our students that we had been teaching for the week. And we were walking through um, the neighborhood, and so she led us through a junkyard. And I thought, you know, oh, we must be passing through a junkyard to get to wherever she lives. It turns out that was her home. And so you see her parents, and this is, you know, it's in a lot of pictures that you see of migrant workers. Um, her parents, what they do all day is sort out the trash in different piles. And then we were led to her home, which was a one room, um, uh, you know, one bed for about four people. Um, and that was when I was struck uh, by the fact that, you know, if this senior in high school believed in what education could do for her, then she wouldn't have to follow the footsteps of her parents. And that was when everything that you know Nick Kristof says in his columns every week and, and everybody else says about education and what it could do for poverty just finally clicked for me. And it was such an amazing moment for me because I was able to have that with my student who was right next to me um, who had developed a student-teacher relationship with that <coughs> senior in high school. Um, I'm sorry, senior in middle school. Um, and so uh, she told me the next day, um, I saw her, one of the most touching images I have is her walking hand in hand with that student back to school after that because the student was leading us back to the school so that we could get back to our hotel. And I remember the next day, um, I think they had had their one-on-one -on -one conversation and my student then sharing with me that, um, you know, after the entire week of, um, you know, Yale students and Yali students being there um, and talking about dreams and college and everything that sh uh, this student then shared with her, that I want to go back um, to school again, and I want to go to university. And originally, she had shared with us that, um, you know, I want to go and be a, a and cut hair, which is fine. But then it was just so powerful that um, to be able to share that moment and then have my own also <coughs> transformation of realizing what education could do for poverty. And so, I just remember it's just one of those moments, and I think many of us have, have had those moments where we just learn so much from our students and also so much alongside our, our, our students in um, just what China is now and its own trans transformation and what the world is now as well. Um, Seth? Yeah. Bill gives us transformation, and I can't think of any Yale China teacher in any decade who hasn't felt that transformation in Carol relationship, the relationship that goes so deep, when national relationships can be cold and can be difficult, but personal relationships are profound. Um, I mean, Drake, these things echo through lifetimes. I wish if you could, can, can give us a sense of, uh, there you are now, you're, you're in Hong Kong, you're with Goldman Sachs, you're working in this environment every day. Can you in your mind sort of trace the thread back from those early days in the 70s and your relationships, your transformation maybe then, and how it plays out in the work you do today? Yes. Yes, uh, th that's a very good, very good question. Um, when, I, when I was on the Yale China program, I already spoke some Chinese, but I, I didn't intend for my life to be an Asia-centered life. I, I had it sort of as a hobby. But I, I found I just couldn't get away. And after I finished the Yale China program, I, I, I did some work in, in Chinatown in San Francisco. Then I eventually came back to Hong Kong in the 1980s. And all, uh, during all that time, um, I found that the one-on-one -on -one communication I would have with individual Chinese was very, very different. 
from the government to government conversation or even institution to institution conversation. Now, and I learned that at Yale China, now in my own work with, with Goldman Sachs, I work with um, the Chinese bank ICBC, Gongchang mm Yinghang, -hmm. and Industrial, I, and Industrial Commercial Bank, Bank of China. And, and um, <coughs> although on an institutional level, the, the relationship is very formal, on a personal level, I've made lots of good friends within that bank and, and lots of good friends in both Beijing and Hong Kong as well. And it was the Yale China <coughs> program that taught me one-on-one -on -one communication. American to Chinese is very, very powerful and many times can be much more powerful than institution to institution. I think we've seen that again and again where the, the nation's sense of each other broadly can be such prisoner of myth and stereotype and the leverage of Yale China teachers who know the culture so intimately and can bring that then into their whole life yeah. work. Very powerful.